Good afternoon. What a great afternoon. Uh, we couldn't have weather any better out here than this. I think everyone would agree. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Ruth Downton and members of her family, select woman Susan Pippin, American Lighthouse Foundation representative Doug Bingham, members of the Cedar Point Association and the Situate Historical Society, Harbormaster Elma Pooler, Flying Santa George Morgan, friends and supporters of Situate Light, including Herb Jason, who is here. Welcome and thank you for helping us add another chapter to the history of this grand old lighthouse. Today is one of those very significant and special moments in the history of Situate Light as we honor George Downton and Jamie Turner by adding their names as official keepers of Situate Light. To my knowledge, in the long history of the United States Lighthouse Establishment, no municipality has ever before taken this action. Why Situate and why now? Simply, this town is unique. When we approached the Board of Selectmen concerning the dedication, they jumped on the idea and agreed with us that simply put, it was the right thing to do. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the Selectmen for their total support. So here we are, ready to make history by honoring two keepers that were stalwarts in preserving this lighthouse. Jamie Turner near the beginning of the 20th century and George Downton near the century's end. Because of their efforts, Situate Light will shine brightly into the 21st century and beyond. We're fortunate today to have Doug Bingham here from the American Lighthouse Foundation, and I've asked him to speak on the lightkeeping tradition. Doug. Thank you, David. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm not a native of Situate, not a resident either, but uh, live in the town of Randolph, but I do a lot of volunteering here during the summer months, and it's, uh, to me, just an honor to be involved with uh, one of the oldest lighthouses in the United States. Uh, this is probably regarded, I believe, as the number 11, the 11th oldest in the U.S., and one of the original of the first 24 or 30 lighthouses that were built here in the U.S. I thank you for inviting me to speak here today in this very special and joyous and somewhat solemn occasion. I've been asked to speak about the lightkeeping tradition. First of all, a lightkeeper was expected to maintain and operate a lighthouse station that was ready for inspection at all times, in all weather, regardless of the circumstances. He or she, in many cases, had to be a jack of all trades. They had to be a machinist, a plumber, a carpenter, blacksmith, roofer, painter, etc. They couldn't depend on anybody else but themselves to get the job done. Lightkeepers were given an awesome responsibility. They had to know how to operate and maintain every piece of equipment. Ignorance of the rules was not acceptable. The lanterns of the towers had to be ready at a moment's notice when heavy or foul weather occurred. The fog signals at each station had to be ready to operate also at a moment's notice. The lives of the fishermen and the merchant seamen in the areas where the lighthouses were located depended on them for their very lives. Think back to the time of the Portland Gale in 1898, which affected this shoreline. The seas were turbulent, winds were blowing over 60 miles an hour. Every lightkeeper in the first district that night fought waves and high winds, which were pummeling their stations, leaking rain and snow into the lantern rooms. The storm panes in the lantern rooms were cracking and breaking, but against all the odds, most every lighthouse keeper in the first district managed to keep their lights burning. Forty years later, during the hurricane of 1938, the three men assigned to Boston Light had their own personal hell to live through. Seas were breaking over the little Brewster Island, forcing the Babcock family to seek shelter on the second floor of the keeper's house. And the same occurred in the assistant keeper's residence on Little Brewster. One of the assistant keepers was working his way into Boston Light during the hurricane of 38, when suddenly one door, the main door to the lighthouse, was ripped from its hinges and was blown into Boston Harbor. The wind was blowing so violently that it rushed up into the tower. Look at these towers, they're built like chimneys. Where does the air have to go once it goes in that door? Nowhere but up. The wind was blowing so violently it rushed up into the tower and caused the kerosene lamp to explode into a ball of flame. The three keepers managed to extinguish the flame and get the lamp relit, 
and all three men at Boston Light had to stay awake and stand on the hatch into the lantern room until the hurricane subsided to prevent another explosion. At other times, the keeper's day was filled with the mundane tasks of completing paperwork and recording the day's events in the logbooks, which were many. There were logbooks for recording the amounts of fuel used in the lanterns in the residences, logbooks for supplies, logbooks for ships uh, passing their stations, logbooks for personnel records, for weather, and so on. Then there was the routine maintenance of the station's buildings and equipment. The keepers of the lighthouses never knew when the district superintendent was going to pay a visit his station. So it was of the utmost importance that every piece of equipment be checked and maintained each and every day without exception. Brass work was the lightkeeper's worst enemy. Each piece of brass, and there was a lot of it, had to be shined every day, including the handles on the station's brushes, the dust pans, the copper pipes in the kitchens had to be shined by the keeper's wives. Anything that wasn't painted, anything that could be shined had to be shined. The portholes in the towers, in many cases, the handrails and the lighthouse staircases also had to be shined if they weren't made of wood. There was an unwritten rule. If it moves, grease it. If it doesn't, paint it. If it's brass or copper, polish it. They never went without something to do. Being a light keeper to some sounded like a romantic notion, but it was quite the reverse. It meant hard work, long hours, low pay, little or no vacation. And if I can give you a really good instance, Ida Lewis down at Newport Harbor Lighthouse which is now the Otto Lewis Yacht Club, went 55 years serving as a lightkeeper, 55 years without a day off. It meant complete dedication to the rules and regulations of the lighthouse service. Who else could be held, held accountable for the operation of a U.S. government lighthouse station? Only the keepers. We're gathered here today to honor a man who epitomized the meaning of the word or the name lightkeeper. He was here when Situate light, light shined its beacon for the first time since 1860. He saved this historic lighthouse from destruction in the now infamous perfect storm, the Halloween storm of 1991. He was dedicated to preserving this old 1811 lighthouse, and he reveled in being allowed to live here. He was a Situate Light, can be sure, he was the keeper of Situate Light. That man was George Downton. He kept a good light. Thank you. The program uh, has it that uh, Ralph Crossan will be giving one of the proclamations. However, he was called out of state uh, uh, because of family illness. So Susan Fippen uh, will be doing both of the proclamations for uh, us this afternoon. The first proclamation signed by the selectmen is for Jamie Turner. While everyone knows George's role here over the last 14 years, some may not realize if it not, had not been for Jamie Turner and his wife Jessie, quite possibly there would be no lighthouse here today, certainly not one owned by the town of Situate. When Selectman Pippen reads the proclamation for Jamie Turner, listen carefully and you'll hear, hear how Jamie and Jesse, Jamie and Jesse Turner save this lighthouse for all of us to enjoy. The Turners loved this light and spent their last years here beginning in 1948 as keepers. It was during the 1950s that many in attendance now were treated to great stories told by Jamie of a time long ago. Carol Vollmer will be accepting Jamie Turner's proclamation on behalf of the Situate Historical Society. Carol's family were uh, very close friends with the Turners. Susan. Thank you, Dave. Unfortunately, I was not in situate at the time of Jamie Turner's selectman service. The first citation that I have is for Jamie Turner, who was a selectman from 1904 till 1941. And it reads, whereas Jamie Turner served 22 years on the Board of Selectmen from 1904 to 1941, many times as chairman, and whereas Jamie and his wife Jessie saved situate life, from public auction by rus rushing to federal authorities in Boston with a check from the town treasury. And whereas Jamie Turner resided at and maintained Situate Light from the early 1950s until shortly before his death in 1965, the Board of Selectmen hereby expresses its sincere thanks to Jamie Turner 
by adding his name to the official list of light keepers of Situate Light. Carol? My how government has changed. Um, I read with interest in the Mariner that when he found out that it was up for auction, he went into the treasurer's office to get a check for $1,000. <laughs> Today, if I walked into the, to the Treasury for $10, I would be summarily laughed out of, out of the office and certainly would walk out empty-handed. However he accomplished this, he deserves our respect and admiration for saving this treasure for all of us. Next, I have a citation for George Downton. <laughs> if ever you've um, tried to run a nonprofit with volunteers, you know how hard it is to get people to work. Everybody's so busy, they're, they're taking their kids to soccer and so forth. The first time I met George was at the animal shelter. He came in and asked if he could volunteer. So of course I asked what shift you would like to do. And he said, well, what do you mean one shift? I want to work every day. So my eyebrow kind of went up and I said, this guy doesn't know how hard this work is. He certainly won't be doing it for long. I'd give him a week. George went on for years. He recruited other people. I see Rosie Rines is here. She was one of George's best friends. He even earned Volunteer of the Year. We were so proud of him. At the time, we didn't know that he was working for the Historical Society, too, many, many hours. He was truly committed to this place. You could see it in his face, the, the love, the contentment, the pride. And to George's wife, Ruth, and his family, our hearts go out to you. We all share the sadness of losing George. What I will miss most are the big smiles, those rosy cheeks, and that mischievous twinkle in his eye. We've lost a gem. His legacy lives on, and today is a wonderful tribute to his years of hard work. Ruth? Whereas George Downton resided at Situate Light from 1986 until his death in, in 2000, and whereas during those years he maintained the lighthouse, protected it on numerous occasions from damage, and actively participated in its relighting as a private aid to navigation after 134 years of darkness, and performed all the other duties traditional expected, traditionally expected of a lightkeeper. The Board of Selectmen hereby expresses its sincere thanks to the family of George Downton by adding his name to the official list of lightkeepers for Situate Light and pronounces that during his tenure as keeper, he kept a good life. Thank you. My family and I would like to thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. I think this is a true story. Uh, when George volunteered uh, at the animal shelter, the only thing that Ruth said at the time, make sure you don't bring home any cats. <laughs> well, he did. And then she figured it was all right to bring home a second one, so he ended up with two of them. George Downton was my friend. My definition of a good friend is someone who gives and doesn't ask for anything back. That was George. I know if he were present today, he would be embarrassed and probably a little more than irritated with all the attention being given him, but we're doing it anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why we have this kind of a day. Shortly after George passed away, someone asked me if there was anyone available to take over his responsibilities. Sometimes you're asked easy questions and sometimes you're not. This was an easy question. The answer, of course, was no. George was one of a kind. As Ding, Doug Bingham outlined the expectations of a light keeper, I couldn't help think back to what George did on a daily basis for this light. Everything Doug mentioned that was expected of a good light keeper, George did. Shortly you'll hear about George's other contributions to Situate. I'm limiting my comments to George's role as light keeper. George and Ruth Down became keepers of this light in 1986. All it took was a quick chat with them, and it was obvious they would make great friends, great neighbors, 
and great light keepers. It was also immediately clear that <coughs> George and Ruth took their role of light keepers seriously. George enjoyed his time in the Navy, and that is probably why he liked being light keeper so much. George was on top of every aspect of the workings and maintenance of this light, and we're certainly finding that out as we go uh, into the months after he has passed away. The history board located adjacent to his plaque is one small example. Each year he took it down and painstakingly repainted all the letters. It was a job that took many hours, but he loved doing it. In 1989, the town of Sidgwick received a state grant to reconstruct Lighthouse Park. George kept a close eye on the project for the neighborhood. He did the same when major repairs were made to the outer jetty. George also kept a close lookout for mariners in trouble. When one of them was spotted, he notified the harbor master. The most harrowing time for this lighthouse and for George and Ruth occurred in October 1991. At the height of the Halloween storm, scenes began to pound the keeper's cottage. George realized he had to take action and fast. He gathered up what lumber he could and shored up the walls. If it hadn't been for George's efforts, the building would have, been, would have sustained serious damage. After the storm, the news media scrambled to talk to him. The one thing he did not enjoy was talking to the media. When there was an impending storm, and the press was walking to the area, he'd call me and say, they're here. <laughs> it's your job to take care of them. Fortunately, one time after the Halloween storm, he did agree to be photographed. At the conclusion of this dedication, you were invited to visit the runway between the keeper's cottage and the tower to see the first phase of a new exhibit depicting the history of situate light. One of the panels is dedicated to George and shows him right after the storm. The panels were installed yesterday, and I made Ruth promise not to go into the runway until after the dedication. Ruth, did you keep the promise? Yes, I did. All right, she <laughs> says she did. Some of you might know, or might not know, that Ruth is a trustee of the Situate Historical Society. As such, it's not easy to keep actions taken by the Society from her. However, this is one of two surprises for her today. In 1994, George oversaw the reactivation of the lighthouse as an aid to navigation after 134 years of darkness. Soon after the relighting of fishermen leaving Situate Harbor displayed on his sail, thanks for the light. Today we say the same by dedicating this memorial plaque. And before I go on, <clears throat> last night I was going through some papers for the society and I came across a note that had been sent to me about a month ago and it's from a woman thanking us for something else. But at the end of the note, she wrote, we enjoyed our recent visit with Ruth Downton, and we're glad to see that she is doing well under the circumstances. We're also happy to learn that with the support of her family and the Situate Historical Society, she has decided to stay at the lighthouse where she and George were so happy. I think that kind of sums up a lot of what a lot of people feel. I can't think of anyone who gave more of himself than George. He was, one t he was truly one of those rare individuals that we call the salt of the earth. My last comment is this. The best compliment that can be made about any lighthouse keeper is that he kept a good light. George kept a good light and so much more. John Galuzzo is the Special Projects Coordinator for the Society. He'll be speaking next. I first met uh, George and Ruth about two and a half years ago, uh, March of 1998, when the town of Hull was one of the four national finalists for the uh, National Lighthouse Museum. And uh, it was my job for the town of Hull to put together a tour of South Shore Lighthouse sites you know, within a few moments' notice, they just came to me and said, John, can you do this? And I said, well, <laughs> I know a few people I can call. One was Dave. So I called up Dave, and he called up George and Ruth, and sure enough, that same afternoon, we were able to get the National Lighthouse Museum Site Selection Committee, who had gathered from around the country, up to Situate Lighthouse here. And uh, George and Ruth were just fantastic, and it helped us out tremendously to have that happen. Well, one of the things that came out of that whole uh, process with the Lighthouse Museum project was that the, there was a good positive momentum built up in the town of Hull for the town's history. And uh, the same people who had 
been involved in that process, then decided to put together a book on the town's history, which we released last November, and we we're very happy it actually sold out all 1,200 copies in the first two weeks that it had been on the shelves, and uh, it was a really positive momentum, positive event. So when I came to work for Situate, uh, one of the first things I pitched to, to Dave and the trustees was that we do a similar book for Arcadia Publishing, Images of America. And uh, I'm not here to, to hype that book today, although it will be released in a week. It's 1899, and you can buy it from the Situate Historical Society. But I am here to tell you that uh, what we've done is that uh, George's passing kind of coincided right with the beginning of when we were putting together the book. And there was no doubt in our minds, the four authors, David Ball, Fred Freitas, Carol Miles, and myself, that the book should be dedicated to George Downton. So, Ruth, when you open up to page uh, six, you'll see that our new book is dedicated to George. And this is the photograph that you'll see also inside here on the wall. Now Ruth probably realizes why I haven't given her the picture back yet. We needed it for the book. <laughs> um, Fred Freitas, trustee, is going to talk about contributions that George made to the Maritime Museum, followed by Paul Miles, uh, who is going to speak on the contributions that George made to the Citrus Historical Society and other areas. So, Fred. Uh, Ruth and family, guests members of the Situate Historical Society, friends and neighbors. The Roman philosopher Seneca said in the first century AD that friendship creates a community of interest between us in everything. George exemplified this in all that he did, but particularly with regard to the Maritime and Irish Mossy Museum. The door leading into the museum was dedicated to George for many reasons, which would take too long to list, but I would like to focus on two. Now, for the first one, you need to picture this scene in your mind. Uh, your significant other has decided that it's time to change the color of, say, your living room. Now, if you're like me, my first response is, why, it looks fine to me. But after you get that look, you then go down to the paint store, buy the paint that she's picked out to do the job, you go back and you paint the room. And once you've finished painting, you put all the materials away and you've cleaned up and you're admiring your work when your significant other walks in and says, no, I don't like the color on the wall. You're gonna have to paint it again. What would your response be? Well, this happened to George at least three times to my knowledge with the museum. Pam Martell, our museum's designer, would call George to tell him that the color didn't come out the way that she had expected it to, and that, George, would you mind painting the white over the gold to cover it? Or Dave and I, as the, exec uh, as the exhibit court, he would change the plans for an exhibit and say, George, that color you painted it, can you do it again? Well, if you know George, you know what the response was. If you didn't know George, you can guess what the response was. <laughs> Regardless to say that before it was needed, that room was repainted or that exhibit was done again. That was George. Always there to help, always there to offer suggestions. In the shipbuilding room, of which I'm a curator, you'll find many examples of George's presence. Start with the model of the Helen Foster which was the last ship that was built on the North River. After George had finished the model of the Portland for the shipwreck room, he said to me that the shipbuilding room needed a model as well. And after sharing several ideas with me, uh, he settled on a model that's presently in the room. Look again at the ship shipbuilding tools that are uh, all over the walls. That's George again. After getting the okay from Pam, George and I mounted them on the wall. We put drills, and an oak block on the floor. Why, even the Briggs shipyard's lathe owes a debt to George. 
It was George, Dave, and I who moved it from the Cudworth barn to the shipbuilding room. Finally, the favorite display of all the children who enter the shipbuilding room is the cottage with the attached room with skiff for skiff and dory building. It's right in the center of the room. Yep, George built it. His touch is everywhere in that museum. Just a couple of weeks before he died, I was visiting George, and before my visit was over, he brought me out to his workroom. There was another model he was working on. This one would demonstrate to visitors how a ship was constructed in the North River shipyards. Freddie said, I'm not going to be able to finish this, but I'm sure Charlie Sparrow will. This too was George, thinking of others right to the end. Charles Caleb Colton said, true friendship is like sound health. The value of it is seldom known until it's lost. Today I add my voice to praise my true friend, George Downton. to all of us that uh, what already has been said of George and his devotion to maintaining and restoring the White House, that he was an unusual man who left a good mark, a memorable mark on all of us. George was the facilities ma maintenance manager for the Historical Society, and as such, I had the pleasure of working with him in recent years on a number of projects at various historical properties and found him, as you already heard, to be a very talented man with a wonderful sense of humor. Whenever he worked on a particular project, he went at it with complete dedication and good humor. And I also understand that in all of this, he also served as uh, on the Waterways Commission of the town and regularly tested the water quality in the harbor, among all of his other duties. He was a key contributor to our development of a five-year repair and restoration plan for the four town-owned historical properties, this lighthouse, Boston Tower, the Man House, the Cudworth House, and to detail the valuation and repair and restoration needs of the six historical prop, um, society properties. Just as a little anecdote regarding his sense of humor, he was always uh, coming up with related anecdotes to spice up our various joint endeavors, particularly when it came to uh, the lighthouse and the maritime museum or anything to do with the sea. During this, uh, one day, he made a couple of uh, humorous comments about people with clipboards. And what I have in my hand but a clipboard. <laughs> that clipboard stayed home and I had a piece of paper in my pocket after that, ever, forever after. And he appreciated the lack of the clipboard. It's just incredible to me the amount of work that the man did throughout the society uh, properties and particularly here. When he wasn't repairing or painting the lighthouse or at the Maritime Museum or other properties, he was applying his considerable talents to building scale models of boats and ships. His attention to detail was absolutely amazing. How did he find the time? I just, it just boggles my mind. We owe many thanks to George for the lessons he provided, including the need to work with a smile. He always had a smile on his face. I'm sure there were times when, when it was the other way around, but uh, every time I saw him, he had a smile on his face and a, a wonderful comment about the day. He was, in a real sense, a guiding light, as with the lighthouse, to others through dedication to this lighthouse and Maritime Museum and other historical activities. And finally, the town of Situate has been fortunate indeed to have had George and Ruth here for 14 years. 
two people who had a deep interest in preserving this lighthouse for others to enjoy now and in the future. Thank you. just asked Ruth how she wanted to go about the unveiling and she asked that her grandson Jack uh, do the actual unveiling. Um, once that is done, I think it it's probably makes the most sense to uh, come over, if everybody come over and take a look at the monument. I'm, we're all real pleased with the way it, it came out. I discussed uh, this with Ruth. Uh, way back in, I guess, March, we agreed on the wording. And this, at, at, at the end of the unveiling, this will end this part of the program, but I do want to make sure everyone knows that we're having a reception at 92 Lighthouse Road. That's Betsy and Ralph Brown. There's a lot of food over there, and we're anxious to have you take advantage of that. And for those of you that don't know where it is, it's the first house right over here. Also, please make sure you go into the runway this afternoon and check out the panels, one of them being, of course, George's. Uh, you may also go up into the tower to the top of the stairs. Do not go up the ladder. Uh, the ladder's been marked off in any case, so that you, that's as far as you can go. But one other thing that you will see that George was involved in was the uh, removing of all the paint inside of the tower. The tower is now back to the way it was in 1827. Uh, and it'll give you kind of a, a new perspective on the construction of the of the building. So, Jack, would you come on up and do the unveiling, please? memory of George Downton, Keeper of Situate Light, 1986 to 2000, in quotation marks, he kept a good light. Thanks all for attending. Ruth, you have to say. Thank you. On behalf of the family and I, we thank you all very much. This is wonderful. I'm sure George is looking down on us today, and is, we're all very proud. Yeah, the Thatcher Island Association. I know. Yeah, you know. Are you awake? This, this guy's name is. Uh, Scott Kennedy. Huh? Okay. Well, I wish we had known them then. And, you know, they were uh, only in the house a week. I want to get back up. Yeah, we're going to get back up. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Yeah.